<laughs> okay. <laughs> cameras, <laughs> cameras are rolling. Go ahead and introduce. Tell me, uh, tell me where we are, who you're talking with, what we're going to do. Good. Hi, I'm Jim Larson. I'm the one of the board members for the Northwest Dive History Association, and we're collecting uh, oral histories from people that have been involved in the scuba business uh, for a long time. And we're trying to make sure that we preserve the histories of, of diving. So everybody has a garage full of dive gear, but when we're dead and gone, they're just gonna take that to the dump and get rid of it. Um, but the histories, I think, are what is important. So we're here tonight with Jim Steele. Uh, he's the owner of, of Steele's Discount Scuba in Oakland, California, and has been in the dive business since he was a wee child. So, Jim, uh, when and how did you get started in diving? Uh, my early memories uh, were probably about 1954. Uh, my father came home from a dive class with my brother. And he was announcing to my mom that the snorkels they have are not adequate because they're shaped like a big hook on top that would hook the kelp and and not function because it had a hook with a cage with a ping pong ball in it. So what the instructors recommend that people do with those snorkels is to take a hacksaw and cut off the uh, J top. And then it was a good functional snorkel. And I remember sitting on the stairs, you know, going upstairs uh, in the house, uh, watching the conversation take place, thinking, hmm. So in 1954, you were not very old yet? No, I was probably about four or five years old. Uh, the first class was taught in San Lorenzo at the San Lorenzo Recreation Department, I guess. Uh, and a lot of really cool people put on the first class. So people that I grew who up the with. the instructors were? Oh, yeah. Uh, I worked with them uh, in years past. Uh, uh, Don Thompson was, uh, he was in charge of the uh, local chapter of the uh, American Red Cross. He, uh, went before that he went to uh, San Diego and he went through uh, Conrad Limbaugh's program at Scripps and then he came back and uh, uh, you know was gonna write a program for the American Red Cross and he did it wasn't accepted because American Red Cross felt that underwater swimming was too dangerous uh, and then there was uh, Bill Galt and Bill was uh, he, he, I think military trained and he taught uh, diving uh, uh, to the special forces or something in the military and he eventually became one of the engineers and uh, salespeople over at Rick's Industries in Emeryville and he was an engineer from uh, aerospace industry he worked for Aerojet and he in fact taught my wife to dive many many years later when he was running a program for the uh, San Leandro uh, Boys Club they had a program there. And then Bob Duponte was a young guy. He was about 17. I don't know where he learned to dive, but he was a uh, detective uh, for the San Francisco Police Department. And then Al Michelo was one of the other instructors. He owned a commercial diving school in Oakland uh, called, uh, uh, I think, Al Michelo's Commercial Diving School. <laughs> So, so, so how did you get from, so you learned to dive, so mm -hmm. you were then a recreational diver, well, a, and yeah. so when did you start helping with classes and start teaching? And well, we would, my, my dad, you know, we started an instruction program, which was, uh, well, we supported, is a better way, because he didn't really want to compete with the uh, instructional program because he wanted all the instructional programs to basically to send him his business. He didn't want to compete with them. So we've uh, helped out with uh, many instructional programs after uh, the first classes uh, in the San Lorenzo Rec Department. One was Aquatutus, which is a dive club that we're sitting next to tonight. They were founded uh, back then to, uh, you know, further the sport and teach diving. And uh, then there was uh, the rec department in uh, Pleasant Hill, uh, Walt Killian and uh, Dick Pollock, they were instructors out there, and uh, Oakland uh, YMCA with Bill Galt, Bill 
uh, took that over and started teaching, and then uh, I don't know, a few other programs around. And my dad would go to the different classes and bring equipment, and you know, we'd do the equipment part. And uh, the people would get kind of, uh, you know, I, I was playing with it all the time in the pool. And so, uh, like Dick Pollock would have me demonstrate the skills to his class, and I was probably about eight or ten years old at the time. And so, basically, that's ended up ended up being worked into it, kind of kind of by just the fact that what your dad was doing. Sure, we go ab diving and uh, diving, and we were really lucky to be in uh, Northern California because the diving here is just incredible. Um, we have the North Coast which is my favorite. We have, you know, abalone and fish and camping in the California coastal redwoods and, you know, the clubs would go up there and have big picnics and, you know, and camp outs and that was uh, a really cool thing to do. And of course, I, I can't remember, you know, as far back, we'd always go up there and, you know, hang out with them and, and go ab diving and free diving. And then I eventually got into scuba diving uh, at the the Alacosta Divers, which is another very old dive club that's still in existence. In fact, uh, 36 of their members are in Cozumel right now. Uh, they meet at the Arenda Library the first Monday of the night of, of the of the month, and uh, uh, they had a pool night. And my dad and would always bring gear over to the pool night, and we would let the club play with the new things, you know, like the full face mask from England and the Voigt uh, Porta Sub, which was a little scooter he'd pull you around. I remember some of the toys we'd bring over. And, uh, and of course, I would play in the pool too. And then when I turned, uh, I think about 16 or, or so, I was, I was old enough at that time then to, to take a dive class because before that, uh, you know, in the old days, you had to be at least 15 or 16 to take a dive class. So I went to Richmond and we took the dive class with the Richmond Wide Divers out at the uh, at the Richmond Pool, and Smokey Slocum certified me. Uh, and, uh, and then I went back and helped in the classes uh, with the, at the Berkeley Y, Richmond Y, and Oakland Y. So at about 16, I was teaching uh, three nights a week, like I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't That's stopped. Good. Yeah. That's good. Uh, and uh, yeah, so. So you became a NAWI instructor when? I know you've got a pretty old number. I went, uh, I think it was about 1969 or 70. I wanted to go to a YMCA institute because I was, you know, teaching with the Y people. We were all buddies. And uh, I went down to San Diego and visited an old friend, which was, his name was Roger Martin. He was the uh, director of the Oakland YMCA, who I'd, you know, go hang out with. And he, they, he moved, they moved him to San Diego, and he's doing that way now. And he was saying, oh, he says, uh, you should take the instructor class down here because uh, we're doing a cooperative class with NAWI at uh, San Diego, uh, University of, you know, San Diego. San Diego State College. Anyway. Could have been San Diego State. I'm not sure. Anyway, so I said, yeah, that sounds great, and I'll get a dual certification. So I signed up for the program, and at the last minute, the Y backed out because they couldn't uh, get, agree on anything. You know, Y and Nawi, they would never agree. So I figured, okay. So I just went through, and uh, and uh, it was really a great program. We had, uh, I think, we had about 50 candidates in the program, and uh, it was like basic training. You know, you. Uh, I remember the first day. Uh, you know, well, we showed up and. They kept us up until about uh, 3 in the morning, and then they got us up at 6 and went to the pool, and we did all the, uh, you know, the tests, uh, you know, trading water and underwater swims and all that, and they saved the 440 till the very end. We had barrels around the pool, but before we went there at 6 a.m., we were in the mess hall, and they chowed us down with the most greasy food they could find. <laughs> and then we went to the pool and uh, did all the, the skills, and it was easy for me because uh, I was in the water all the time and all the swimming and everything. And uh, what was, uh, and I remember uh, half the people uh, after the 440 would get up out of the water and vomit into the uh, big barrels. <laughs> and that was sort of a bonding thing. Uh, but before I went there, I, I went to uh, Laney College where I had the great pleasure of working with Don Thompson, who is. Uh, guy who wrote the program for the 
American Red Cross, who he claims the YMCA stole his program. Uh, and uh, so on Mondays, I would show up to class one, which I think was advanced swimming. Then I would go to uh, another swimming class. I forget what that was. Then I took uh, uh, life WSI. And then after WSI, I went and, and did the scuba class with Don. Yes. And uh, so I was in the water practically all day on Monday, which was probably one of the best things I ever did in my life because it really gets you in good shape to be in the water. Everybody should swim. You know, everybody who walks and talks and should swim at least three days a week for 30 minutes a day for their health and keep our medical costs down in the medical field. Yeah, so after you, after you became an instructor, I assume you came home and, and went to work for your dad teaching classes? Mostly working in the store and teaching classes and going to school. I had a pretty full day. Pretty full day. So, uh, who were some of your other early mentors? Uh, you've talked about several in there, but at, when you're when after you're an instructor and you're back in town teaching, who did you? It was there anybody that you modeled yourself after, or 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 tried to emulate because uh, you were impressed with them? Well, yes. Be, it's, it, there's so many people. It's incredible. Um, I, I probably TA'd for at least 10 different instructors before I actually went to become an instructor in terms of, you know, seriously TA and for right. entire classes. And uh, Andy Coltart was a really sharp instructor. He was a Naui instructor that taught uh, classes over on the Coast Guard base. And I TA'd one or two classes for him to see what I could learn there. And uh, a lot to learn. <laughs> and uh, and then of course Bill Galt has always been one of my heroes as a kid. He taught my dad to dive. Don Thompson, you know, who is. You so know. That, that's quite a that's quite a resume of, of people you worked with. So so I know that that your folks owned uh, the sporting goods store. How mm -hmm. did that evolve into? I understand that at one point in time you owned five or six different dive stores. I did. Um, and so how did that all come about? Well, uh, in my dad's story, he uh, was a golf professional at the Claremont Country Club. And, um, you know, he, uh, Mr. Dreyer, who owns Dreyer's Ice Cream, suggested to him that he puts a uh, workbench in his front window of this ice cream uh, building that he owned. And so dad rented the, the space from him and started making handmade golf clubs there. And after about two or three years, then he moved down the street to uh, the, the location there on College Avenue, 5815 College. And then after World War II started, he went to work in the shipyards and mom kind of took over the store and ran the store as a sporting goods store. And uh, he made, we made clubs and tennis and golf and shooting, you know, marksmanship. Uh, Dad was, uh, become a, was a marksmanship instructor too, you know, the Rock Ridge Rod and Gun Club. And so, you know, you, have to, can't, you just can't do everything diving, right? Right. And so uh, we, uh, he was working out, he was also, my dad was also a weightlifter. He was working out down at Jack LaLanne's gym. And Jack uh, told him, hey, Howard, what I, I really uh, am curious about this scuba diving stuff. And this was probably about 1953, before the class was in the area. And Dad said, yeah, one of my uh, suppliers, you know, Voigt, they sell scuba gear. And so Jack and bought some scuba gear from my dad. And uh, Jay and Jack went down to Santa Cruz. They put a press release out and said, we're going to go underwater for 45 minutes. And of course, Everybody was curious, and they showed up at Santa Cruz Pier, and they watched uh, Jack go down and hold on to a piling, uh, and Jay, and you know, and breathe air. So Dad got really curious about it, and when the class popped up in San Lorenzo, Dad decided, hey, "I'll take the class because this sounds really cool." So he took the class with my brother, and uh, you know, that's how we got into it. Then about 1960. Uh, before 1960, I guess, we moved the store over to Telegraph Avenue. And by then, the scuba part had really taken over. It was probably uh, 60, 70% of our entire gross. 
And so he said, well, I'm just going to specialize in it because uh, when ha selling guns in your store, it gets broken into all the time because all the kids break in and steal the firearms. Right. <laughs> you know, so he, we decided to get rid of that. And we got rid of uh, he, his brother, Uncle Andy, took over the uh, flood making part of the business and started doing it out of his garage. And everybody's happy. So we just decided to specialize in scuba. And it was a real success. So how did you go from the one store to multiple stores? Well, in 72, I figured that, you know, I was uh, 21. It was time for me to get out on my own. And uh, during that period of time, from the mid-60s, we used to work with Stanford University, San Jose State, De Anza College, uh, West Valley College, and uh, Kenyatta College. Those were the we'd take our vehicle and fill it full of dive gear and when they would start a class the instructors would have us come down and outfit the people because uh, we carried lines that the instructors liked and none of the other shops carried the lines that they liked because they were following John Gaffney's program and uh, you know we had duck feet fins and we bought uh, I don't know 2,000 pair for two bucks a pair or something, we're selling them for five ninety nine. You know, the kids loved it in college, and you know, so anyway, we would go to the colleges and outfit the the, the, the classes. And uh, so my dad, I said, my dad said, well, I'm not going to let you take my store over until you uh, actually, uh, you know, have your own store for a while and can buy me out. And I said, well, that's good, and. Uh, so I went down to uh, Santa Clara because I looked at the area and I figured, gee, you know, we have all the colleges sewed up down there anyway, so there's, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in gross right there, and uh, I'll open up a store. So I found this, uh, I talked to Michael Brennan, you know, Mike had some ideas. He said, wouldn't it be neat to have a store where you had all aisles with all the brands lined up and people could just go around and, you know, buy what they want? I said, yeah, that sounds good. So I found a 5,000 square foot building and uh, rented it and opened up a dive store, put it in there and Bill Galt set me up with a great deal on a compressor. I got one of the uh, non-lubricated Rixes, uh, KB44, which is a fantastic compressor to have if you're a dive shop because it puts out clean air, there's no oil right. you know, in, in the air. And so I got that, it's water cooled so I can run it all day. So I got that, set that up in the store and then uh, just started uh, doing it. Uh, and uh, the first year we did, uh, from April to the end of the year, we did over 780,000 wow. in that market. Because I demographically, you know, uh, you know, figured, you know, how much money there was, and where they were coming from. And, you know, it had the, since all the major freeways go together there, uh, Santa Clara area, you know, right there uh, was the uh, hub of the you know Silicon Valley and so I figured it's the way where to go and so it worked out real good so after about 1975 four I came back and bought my dad out and so I had two stores and uh, then uh, Frank Carley who's an old-time uh, dive store operator he was ready to retire he had a, a Santa Rosa diving center or a store there and he said, Jim, he says, I, he says, half my customers come down to you anyway. And, uh, you know, why don't you just uh, take my store over and just pay me for the gear? And he says, I got a hell of a building. He says, I pay uh, $57 a month rent for my building. And I said, can't lose. So I did that. So I wound up with three stores. And then uh, just before that, I started to go through a divorce. And my ex-wife uh, and I, we split up the, the stores. And I gave her the Santa Clara store because that was the easier one to run. And uh, I took the Oakland store and the Santa Rosa store. And uh, then I opened up a store, uh, well, you know, so we split. Uh, she changed the name to Steel's Scuba and dropped Steel's Scuba Discount. And of course, uh, we went back to court some a couple of years later and the judge didn't think that she changed it enough, so she changed it to a name like Wet Pleasure. And then she sold it to Dan King and he changed it to Diver Dan in the uh, late 90s or mid 90s. 
And so after I opened up the Santa Rosa store, that went really well. And then I opened up uh, a store in Hayward. Uh, Cheryl came to me, who bought the Anchor Shack from Bob Hollis, and she said that she has to give up the lease because she can't make it there. And, uh, and she knew that I was looking to buy a building uh, about a quarter mile from her down on, uh, you know, it was an old health club that had a pool and everything, and that would have been great. But she said that she has a great lease on the building, and she'll introduce me to the landlord. And so I, I rented that and opened up the store there. It was already had a pool in the back, and was, I didn't have to do much to set it up. It was good. Then from there, I opened up another store in Sacramento uh, because Clyde, my friend Clyde Knoll, who was one of my uh, major mentors, especially on the business side, uh, he said that uh, uh, Motherload's going out of business. Uh, Dolphin is closing because, uh, you know, the, the, uh, Ken had some problems. And uh, there was a sporting goods store there. It wasn't Oshman's. It was something like Oshman's. They were big in the dive thing. They were, they were closing. And uh, that would be smart if I hired Andy from the sporting goods store or hired Mike Johnson from Dolphin because he worked for uh, Ken. And so I interviewed both of them, thought that Mike would be the hot guy to hire. And uh, his dad bought Dolphin instead, which was great. You know, I'm glad for Mike because that turned out really good for him. And we opened the store in Sacramento and did really well because we're about the only game in town for, I don't know, four or five years. And then, uh, and then I opened up a store. I bought a piece of property in Malpitas. And uh, we were going to build a shopping center there, you know, a big, you know, strip building, and uh, put a pool in, and have a, you know, store in part of it, and rent out the other part. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this on on camera or not. <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> uh, it's it's not bad. Uh, Bob Bob McGuire, who is a, a you know, a champion freediver. His son Mike and Frank, they had a store that they had opened recently, you know, just a couple of years earlier in San Jose called Any Water Sports. And, uh, and so Bob was somehow on the uh, historical board in Malpitas. And after I bought the property, he came in and said, oh, that's, that's a very sacred uh, historical piece of property. That, that building there used to be the old fat boy restaurant, the first fast food uh, type restaurant in, you know, the southern you know, the valley here. And so, so you know, you, it can't be touched or remodeled. We have to approve of everything. And so I went into the city and I took out, you know, permits and they didn't know it was historical and they gave me permits to, to, to do some demolition there and stuff. And, uh, and our architect, uh, you know, went in and argued how, you know, it'd be nice. And after about a year of in lawyer fees and everything, we finally got permission to do it. But we ran into a lot of, you know, irritations along the way. And uh, so that was when I opened the Sacramento store. So I was talking to Clyde. And Clyde says, well, why don't you just set up open in Malpitas there, uh, just go right up and do Sacramento because Sacramento is right for the picket and uh, Clyde was right. So we did that. We put our efforts into the Sacramento store and then, you know, put that one more on a back burner just to hold it for a while. Uh, and that worked out. And then eventually uh, we couldn't uh, get the center going the way we wanted it exactly because there were some city glitches, you know, in terms of zoning and things. Uh, and pools, you know, in lots of politics. Lots of politics. So, so we decided, well, why don't we just take the building that's there and we'll remodel that real quick and put a store in there. And then uh, somebody drove a truck through it, <laughs> and the truck was unregistered, and nobody knows who drove it. 
it was just a junker truck that somebody pushed through the building. So we decided, gee, maybe uh, we're not, this isn't meant to be. And so we, uh, uh, right about then, they were putting Tasman through, which is a main thoroughfare, and Malpitas was really coming up. So we saw a big profit, so we sold the, bis the pl lot and said, oh, we have enough stores. The dive businesses sound like that they kept you busy and, and, and were fun, but what's, what's been the most fun you've had in the dive business? Have you been running stores? or Teaching classes. Teaching classes. Yeah. So. yeah. Around the early 90s, I decided to kind of retire because, you know, I had 25 employees and everything was just getting more difficult. We had to keep an INS file and we were responsible uh, and could go to jail if somebody showed us a false uh, green card or something if we hired them. Uh, so, you know, and a lot of little irritations like that. And doing business in California is really hard. Uh, so we decided, well, why don't we just sort of pair back to one store and I'll deal with the people I've been dealing with since I was a kid, because you know, most of them I really enjoy, the, the people, you know. And I'll just mainly do classes. I won't have 25 employees to worry about or and a, you know, 10 or 15 instructors to worry about and just, uh, you know, make it, make it kind of fun, like my garage. Give me a place to go to every day. Yeah. So good. So you, I know that you're still teaching two or three nights a week. And yeah. You're in the water not every weekend, but but a lot, so I, I'm assuming that that's kind of what's kept you into the dive business, is the fact that you're still having fun. I'm having fun. So, um, the, the, what's your, your most favorite dive sites? I know that you're down in Monterey a lot, but what other dive well, sites do you my, really my, my wife and I, we, we enjoy diving Point Lobos. That's pretty awesome. Well, I should mention that my wife has actually been running the company. Uh, ever since we've been married for the last 35 years. Uh, so, she's, so you are allowed to do what you like to do? I'm allowed to do what I like to do, and, uh, and she does all the business stuff. And I just stand behind the counter and smile. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. So, and, and she's been successful enough to build a, through the 80s and uh, 90s. Uh, you know, Susan, she... Uh, built it up to well over a $3 million a year uh, dive shop, which is uh, pretty rare for a non-mail order. Uh, yeah. Pretty respectable. Yeah, good, good amount. Pretty respectable. So you enjoy teaching, you dive uh, Point Lobos, and you dive mm -hmm. uh, Monterey. I spend three, day, three weekends a month down at the breakwater. <laughs> okay. yeah. That's good. And I enjoy it. Yeah. So, do you do any other dive travel? Do you do the South Pacific or the Caribbean or Canada uh, or? Yeah, what? all the above. Uh, I have. Uh, right now, I'm really busy teaching classes. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, and uh, I, I have a place in Hawaii, a couple of places in Hawaii in, on the on Maui, and I like to go over there just to hang out and relax and walk on the beach and do a little diving. Do a little diving. That's good. So, so out of your career, what has been the least fun, the, the, the part of the dive business that has been not so enjoyable? Uh, well, I don't know. It's, it's all been good. I mean, uh, I've had a lot of incredibly good people working for me. You know, there's a lot of people uh, that, you know, I hired. Most of them are really good people because diving attracts a certain kind of person that uh, is, uh, you know, special. We, uh, you know, early on, you know, we had some, you know, internal theft problems. And so I, we basically hired, uh, and if you're in business, you have to do this or it's not going to work. You hire a detective agency to uh, actually handle security for your business. And uh, I think if anybody who has a shop, if they don't do that, they're nuts because uh, they can get hit you know, pretty hard and heavy by just one employee. And uh, the, uh, uh, what we would do is they set up a uh, system of hiring people. This was in the uh, early 80s. A uh, person would come in for an interview. You'd interview them and you'd see, you know, if, they, if you want them to work for you. 
and then you have them come back for a second interview. And the second interview was a, uh, a polygraph examination wow. or a voice stress test, like you know, like the police departments do. Right. They still do that today. And uh, the ones that couldn't pass wouldn't show. I've only had one person show out of over a hundred people who uh, couldn't pass. You know, I've had, and probably uh, 20 or 30 percent of them don't show. And so that, that's the screening thing right there. Before they even take the test, they're, they're screened. And then after they take the test, then you have them come back for a second interview, and then you kind of you hire them or not hire them, and you lay out, you know, what their duties are and, you know, what you expect of them and so forth. Uh, and that's basically the process. Then grant, and most retail places did that. I think it was probably around 86 or 87, uh, Grand Auto got sued because, uh, the, of course, the detective company comes around occasionally and they'll, you know, check things out and they put a person working in your store uh, for two weeks now and then and rotate them to the different stores. And, uh, the, the, and, and so if you have any issues, then the polygraph examiner comes back and polygraphs the people and then you decide if you're going to fire them or what you're going to do. And uh, Grand Auto did that and they fired a, a manager and a couple of other uh, people in their company. And they were sued for three million dollars. And they won because, you know, you're not allowed to uh, do that by law. And so all the detective companies just Stop. vanished, yeah. So, so it sounds like the thing that wasn't fun about the dive business was the employee relationships, if it was anything. So, although my guess is 90% of your your employees became friends and dive. Absolutely, dive. absolutely, yeah, no. So, uh, what do you see uh, as the most significant change in the dive industry since you've started? Well. Um, there's a few changes uh, that are positive and a few changes that are very negative. Uh, one very big negative change, there's a lot of litigation pending and I don't know if this should be said, uh, but um, as an industry we aren't doing a very good job on turning people into divers. A very poor job. Uh, extremely poor and very dangerous. People will die uh, if they're not properly trained. And uh, you can't train somebody to dive in less than 10 hours of pool time with 30, I mean with hour and a half or one hour uh, slots. You can't take somebody and in six hours, uh, one continuous, or you know, teach them anything because after an hour and a half, pff, you're not going to get much done. And it's really simple. Um, people are doing classes in three hours. They're doing classes on weekends where people will come in and do a hour session, two hour session in a pool which they only get an hour's benefit from. Then they come back in the afternoon and they get another two hour session, which they probably only get 30 minutes benefit from. And then they come back the next day and they do the same thing. And then they're off to the ocean a week later. And uh, those people are, can't dive, especially in California. Now, where that may work is in Hawaii or the Caribbean or someplace because the person comes in and you know you show them the skills and it's somewhat okay and then they're on a boat with dive masters that are taking care of them so they do another 10 15 dives under the direction of somebody in clear calm water and maybe at the end of that they developed enough to where they might be okay but so you're certainly not alone in in, in that observation yeah. so um, how about equipment changes that have been positive or significantly change diving? Well, the conch shelf is probably one of the best regulators made. 
and it was designed in 1963 as a sea diver and then renamed after, con after uh, uh, Costos, uh, you know, uh, there really hasn't been any changes in regulators, yeah. period. Yeah. Um, th they've just made them cheaper and chintzier and charge a lot more for them. That's uh, my feeling. How about instrumentation? What, what's your take on the new computers? Well, you're talking to the wrong guy because yeah. I really have a negative uh, view on technology. I'm kind of like a Dan Kaczynski when it comes to, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to mail anybody any bombs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, that's, that's good. good. Uh, but, you know, uh, analog gauges are as good as it gets. You have a pressure gauge. It, uh, you know, shows you how much air you have, and it looks like a pie chart. And when you get a little bit narked, it's easy to understand. When you see the needle get down toward red, hey, you know, time to go up. Uh, having a wrist-mounted gauge that gives you a digital readout on the air, I don't think you get the same, uh, you know, feeling. And also, you have a sending unit on your first stage and you, that goes to the wrist. And they have to sync, and they both batteries have to work. My son Austin uh, took a student out, uh, you know, one of Adanya's people. Uh, he showed up to the beach with his friend's uh, gear, and the guy had one of those, uh, you know, computers. And of course, you know, it wouldn't sync with the air, and, uh, you know, you can go to your buddy and see how deep you are, but you sure can't see how much air you have in your tank. And that's really stupid. Uh, and people pay money for that. They do. They and do. wetsuits have improved. Um, I went to uh, uh, Taiwan uh, about six, eight years ago. And, uh, you know, we're looking at the, you know, what they're building over there and everything. They make things for everybody. You know, people just buy it from one or two sources over there and they put their logo on it and sell it. And uh, they kind of asked us what, uh, Harry Truitt was with me. You probably know Harry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Harry's a cool guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they asked us uh, what we'd like to see. And basically, uh, Harry mentioned he likes the waterproof suit with the uh, tuck-in seals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I kind of like the bear cut suit, you know, the bear pattern. And I, I hate I don't hate, I, I think they're very poor, the, the hyper-stretch materials, because they compress a lot. They make you really cold at depth. It's just a really poor, poor thing to sell somebody, is a suit that's real flexible and comfortable in the shop, but very cold at the bottom of the ocean. And uh, so he said, well, we'd like to, what they thought of was to put the nice soft material here in different places and uh, make the suit, uh, you know. And so, lo and behold, they came out with this nice semi-dry. And I think that's a really good suit for warmth. And lately they developed a uh, five mil oversuit that goes over that. So the back zipper, you don't feel the cold water coming in anymore and you put the hood between the two and it's, it's really, uh, you know, that's improved. Suits have improved. Good. So uh, what would you like to see change in the diving industry? Uh, better classes. Better. People to take and uh, take a class and spend, I spent 15 hours in the pool with the people. Uh, the reason is, is it takes that long for 80% of them, not 100%, 80% of them to develop muscle memory and to train their brain to act, you know, to, 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 to create reflexes. And so you have to spend time with people to make sure that they have that reflex before you take them to the ocean. That's why now he requires a no mask swim. So a person could stay underwater and swim at least 70 feet, breathing through a regulator, and uh, you know, do it. But, you know, but if you take like a three or four or six or even a eight hour class in the water, uh, you're not gonna develop that reflex to any kind of a degree. In fact, I have people that go through my class after 15 hours, I tell them, you know, hey, you know, you didn't do very well in a nomad swim because you had to pop up a couple times. Uh, I'm not gonna take you to the ocean. You're gonna have to go to the next class. And for my own self, I do that for free because, you know, it makes it more fun for me when I take them to the ocean and they're ready. I'd rather see them show up at my next class and not charge them and have them go through again.
And be happy fun divers. And be happy fun divers and be diving 20 years from when they yeah. graduate. So what, what would you like to see, or what do you see as the future of diving in the dive industry? I mean, we're kind of in an interesting change. The number of dive mm -hmm. stores in the U.S. is down. The, the number of new stores that are opening is down. Uh, equipment manufacturers are consolidating a little bit. Mm -hmm. so what do you see? What do you mean, what do you mean a little bit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was being nice. So what do you see yeah. in 10 years or 15 years in this industry? Oh, in a crystal ball? Yeah. I don't see much change. You think it's going to be pretty much the same? Yeah, people are greedy. They want, uh, they want short-term uh, goals. They want to take and get uh, 500 bucks out of a person and spend uh, three hours in the pool and kick them off to the ocean and, uh, you know, take them just off the beach there at the breakwater and not out to the end of the break wall and show them the sea lions and stuff, but just right there and show them sand and starfish and uh, bring them back to the beach, give them their cards. The people get on an airplane, fly to Cayman, uh, get off the plane, jump in the water. They feel kind of awkward. They don't have the reflexes. After a week of diving in Cayman, they start to get things going for them and they start feeling kind of comfortable and they think, boy, this is really great. They get on a plane, fly back, and their friend says, well, let's go diving. Let's go up and shoot some fish or grab some abalone or go to Monterey and look at something and they go oh no I've been to Monterey it really sucks it's so uncomfortable it's dark it's ugly I never want to dive Monterey again but hey uh, three years from now I'm gonna fly back to Cayman and go diving and we're fucking ourselves I'm sorry we're screwing ourselves <laughs> up because we're you we're know not we're, we're not teaching people how to dive locally where they do it and the reason for that is it's real simple I remember having a lunch with Gordy Shear and Gordy was telling me that, oh, we just hired uh, guys from Harvard University to do a, uh, 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 to see, you know, why one of our questions is, is 80% of all the business that we're doing in the dive industry is coming from two states. And it wasn't Washington. It was uh, California and Florida. Okay, so why is that? This is probably 1978 or 75 or something. And... Uh, they concluded that nobody wanted to spend time, like, like our YMCA classes were like 13 or 14 weeks long, because we did a skin diving class, we did, you know, uh, scuba, we did, you know, re we did everything. And, uh, you know, and, and four trips to the, o four weekends to the ocean. And uh, so they, uh, they, they, they didn't want to spend that time learning to dive because you're in Kansas or Colorado, which is demographically the best state in the nation for divers, uh, you know, they just want to do it quick. So John, you know, after, after the report came out, I was talking to John Cronin. When John would come up to San Francisco, we'd go to have, uh, you know, dinner in San Francisco, so Liquid Air would buy it. I know John wanted to go out to dinner, so he'd, you know, let them pay for it, I think. Uh, and so he was saying that uh, he uh, has a solution to the problem, and he came up with a five-module class, you know, and you can have one of your instructors teach the PADI program on Monday and another one on Tuesday and Wednesday, and they're all very consistent. So a person could show up on Monday and by Friday be ready to get on an airplane with a referral and go to the resort and do the ocean water park. And so that would be great for Colorado, but very negative for California. But anyway, so... From there, it just slid downhill. Now you can do it in three hours because it's performance-based. It's not, uh, you know, it's time and performance. Based. Right, it's yeah. And the people don't practice much yeah. in three hours. Mm -hmm. They just yeah. go through the dozen or so skills that they learn, and that's it. And we were uh, having dinner with Jerry Stugan and Clyde because Clyde wanted Jerry and I to get together because we were competitors, and, you know, Jerry's a good guy, and I'm a good guy, I guess. And so... We were having dinner at Clyde's house, and Clyde was, we were talking about that, same thing, about what's going to happen with the quick classes that, that, that you know, they're, they're doing. And, uh, and, and Sue pointed out, she said, well, well nobody's going to need to buy anything because the resorts will have it all. And we kind of thought, Jerry and I said, well, the resorts have horrible gear, because back then they did. Mm -hmm. You know, they, their stuff doesn't work and right. doesn't fit people, and, you know, it's just, well, they need to buy the stuff to go. But, hey, she was right. 
My right. wife's always right. <laughs> that, that's why you stay married. That's, yeah. that's what, yeah. yeah. Like I say, I just stand behind a counter <laughs> smile. She runs the operation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>